Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, City of Bloomington Common Council meeting for Wednesday, January the 11th. Uh, we will begin this evening by having our clerk call the roll. Sorry. Councilmember Smith? Here. Volan? Here. Sim? Here. Scambalori? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rallo? Here. Flaherty? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. And Piedmont Smith? Here. Thank you. To summarize tonight's agenda, uh, we have no minutes for approval, but we will move into reports for council members, followed by reports from the mayor and city offices, and we do have two this evening, followed by council committee reports, and then our first opportunity for public comment. Uh, that will be followed by the election of our officers, and following that, we will take a brief recess for changing of the personnel up here uh, before we move to any assignments to council committees that the new president may have, and then appointments to boards and commissions. That will be followed this evening by legislation for second readings and resolutions. On the agenda is Resolution 22-20, a resolution responding to Monroe County Board of Commissioners Ordinance 22-46, and uh, that will be followed by one last opportunity for public comment before we discuss our council schedule and then adjourn for the evening. So to begin this evening, let us begin with council reports. I will start to my right with council member Smith. I have no real report tonight except I just wanna say happy new year to everybody and to all my colleagues who I looking forward to a great year. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Volan. Reiterate uh, what Councilmember Smith said, wishing everyone a, a productive new year. I also wanted to promote a little event here. This is uh, just published last month. This is uh, Charles Zitlow's new book. It's called 1971, How We Won. And it's a story of the momentous uh, city election of 1971. It's a very interesting read that I've had the privilege to preview more than once. And uh, I just want to say that uh, in this coming election year, everyone will learn uh, something from what happened uh, at this same time 52 years ago. So uh, it's now on sale at local bookstores, and I want to encourage everyone to check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. I'd also like to wish my colleagues and the public and those here in the council chambers Happy New Year as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilmember Scambalori. And the same, otherwise no report. All Thank right. you. Very good. To my left, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, remind everybody that my constituent meetings continue to be on the second Saturdays of each month. Um, so that means this Saturday uh, we will have I will have a constituent meeting. Um, in the winter, it will be uh, only via Zoom. Um, so the link is on the city council page. If you um, click on my name, <clears throat> you'll get to my uh, specific web page. Or if you just look on the right side of the city council website, it should be there on the calendar um, for uh, Saturday the 14th at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenbarger. Hi, thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. I just want to talk about my constituent meetings as well. They are normally on the second Tuesday at 5.30. Um, this month it is the third Tuesday, so that is this upcoming Tuesday, 5.30, and we are sticking to Zoom for now. It seems like most people who participate like that format, so um, it can also be found on the council page with that link. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, same theme here. I just wanted to note that I have a constituent meeting on Monday next week, the third Monday of the month, as is normal for me. Uh, those details for the Zoom link are um, on bloomington.in.gov slash council on the uh, calendar page or the sidebar that has events. Uh, likewise, I plan to stick to Zoom, at least for the time being, uh, though I'm open to the, the possibility of going back to in-person if, if uh, folks prefer that. So if anybody tuning in has a preference, uh, feel free to reach out and let me know. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Rollo. Uh, safe and happy 2023 to everyone. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, very good. And now we move to reports from the mayor and city offices, and we will welcome, first off, our new deputy mayor, Mary Catherine Carmichael. Welcome. Hi, happy new year. Good evening, everybody. Mary Catherine Carmichael, office of the mayor. Thank you for this opportunity to reintroduce myself as I begin serving as your deputy mayor. I've been participating in my city government since our city government, since 1997, first as a parks commissioner for 10 years, then uh, as uh, the first communications director of the Hamilton administration, and then, thanks to your support, I served as the city's first director of public engagement until January 1st of this year when I took over as deputy mayor from Don Griffin. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've loved those positions, and I've had experiences and learned things that only come from public service. I highly recommend it. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir with you folks, but I bring those experiences as well as my time as a radio host at WFIU, Director of Leadership Bloomington Monroe County, owner of my own small business, former board president of the BEDC, a government affairs director at a local utility, and volunteer time spent working primarily on arts and children's issues. I even bring the experience of being a parent to the position of deputy mayor, and I'm sure you can all relate to that. I'm terrifically honored to be and pleased to be the city of Bloomington's second female deputy mayor, and I want to shout out to Maria Heslin, who very graciously reached out to me. Maria was our first female deputy mayor. I want to thank my friends and family who've been so supportive as I take on this new challenge, and my colleagues who are being very patient with me as I learn the ropes of my new portfolio. And of course, I want to thank Mayor Hamilton for his ongoing trust in me and my abilities. Uh, before I wrap up, I want to thank current council leadership. Thank you. I know you're ending your uh, current roles this evening, and it's been delightful to work with you for the last year. So thanks to each of you for taking on those leadership positions. I, I know it's additional work, so thank you. Uh, that's really it, and I just thank you, and happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for our new deputy mayor? Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to hear a report from Housing and Neighborhood Development Director, Mr. John Zodi. Welcome. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just got a brief report for you tonight. Um, I think we're pulling up slides here. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, so as the council uh, may remember on November 16th when I presented a housing report to you, I introduced the uh, allocation of uh, American Rescue Plan dollars through the uh, Home Investment Partnership Program through the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Department. And so I wanted to come back to you tonight and let you know uh, where that was. Um, I also want to uh, seek your input as well as the public's. So I'm not able to uh, sort of get all of you together outside of a public meeting, so I want to make sure you're aware of what's happening. Uh, I want to thank Council Member Rosenbarger for coming to a meeting yesterday we had, uh, but all of you can't do that at once or we'd, we'd be in trouble, so I want to make sure that you all are aware of what's happening uh, as a collective body. So just a reminder, the city is going to receive um, about $2 million in rescue plan uh, funds through the Home Investment Partnership Program, which is one of the affordable housing programs that is allocated to the city of Bloomington and the HAND uh, department. Um, the funds have to be targeted for use to serve four qualifying populations as defined by our regulations in the federal government. And um, all of these populations uh, are in the um, realm of homelessness. Um, number one, uh, a person that would be considered uh, homeless by a traditional definition. The actual definitions of all of these are quite lengthy uh, in regulation, but what you might consider uh, traditionally someone who would be homeless. At risk of homelessness really uh, refers to someone uh, from a financial perspective, primarily, uh, who has a risk of housing insecurity. Um, Number three, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic or dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking. And number four, other populations requiring service or housing assistance to prevent homelessness. So uh, someone that may have a substance abuse disorder, someone that may have other uh, risk factors. Uh, veterans are, uh, would be in this group, uh, for instance. Um, or a person with a disability, perhaps. So the funds have to be used to serve those four qualifying populations. We um, 
have a number of uses for the funds. Uh, supportive services, which is a huge range of activity uh, that we've been uh, getting input on. Nonprofit operation and capacity building, uh, rental housing development, acquisition and development of non-congregate shelter. So that shelter, which is um, uh, where uh, clients maybe um, uh, sleeping in separate rooms or using separate bathrooms, as opposed to congregate shelter where you may find uh, folks being in the same room or the same restroom. This does have a, um, a COVID tie because of the rescue plan, so that's where the, COVID, the congregate versus non-congregate shelter concept comes in. Uh, Tenant-based rental assistance, which is an existing program that we have, um, uh, that we work with the Bloomington Housing Authority on, which uh, provides uh, some rental assistance to certain income qualifying uh, clients. And then um, with those uses, we've been reaching out to folks. There's a prescribed list of required outreach, but we've been uh, doing a little more than that. We're, uh, we've done about uh, two dozen meetings so far. We'll be doing more this month uh, to get input and solicit feedback from those stakeholders in the community uh, that, that we all know and some we don't know. Um, they include service providers, uh, certainly Heading Home of South Central Indiana is a group that we are talking to frequently because uh, we want to dovetail efforts with, with that. Uh, housing agencies, as well as community groups and elected officials like yourselves. So there will be public comment opportunity in addition to tonight. Uh, there is a formal period uh, which will uh, commence uh, on February 6th. We'll have a public hearing at the Redevelopment Commission that meets that Monday evening at 5 o'clock. Uh, we will have an official public comment period, which will be for a period of 15 days, starting in early March. The goal is around March 1st. That'll go up for two weeks of public comment, and we'll put a notice in the paper, and that'll be properly uh, done that way. And then we have to have a draft plan for the allocation uh, to HUD by the end of March. Um, my goal is the third week of March, uh, so that we're ahead of the deadline there. So if someone listening tonight or watching uh, has some input on this, uh, you're welcome to send me an email at hand at bloomington.in.gov. Uh, you're certainly welcome to comment during the official public comment period, but wanted to make the council aware uh, and the public uh, that this was ongoing, is continuing through uh, March when we submit this allocation plan. It's important uh, funds, uh, use, it's an important uh, bit of funds, and we wanna make sure that the, the uses are well, uh, well done, and so I wanted to just give you that brief report tonight, and happy to take any questions if you have it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Zodi? Yes, Mr. Sims. Thanks for the report, Mr. Zodi. Um, how do you propose to publicize that public meeting from March 1st to March 15th? Sure. Do, are you going to nonprofits and or just put something in the paper that no one We'll do both. See? So okay. we reached out to, um, and when, when we're doing the outreach meetings, we let people know kind of what the process is. I sent an email yesterday to, or, uh, to all the Jack Hopkins recipients and the people who'd received community development block grant dollars and let them know of the process. Uh, there are prescribed processes, as you probably know, the notice in the paper and that kind of thing. So we're trying to do a little more than that two week public comment, just trying to get the word out a little more uh, because uh, we often don't receive a lot of public comment during those official times and that is sort of at the end of the process. So uh, I want to get ahead of that a little bit and get the word out uh, in a broader fashion. All right, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate the update. All right, now we move to any council committees. Anyone have any reports this evening? And I will just briefly comment on the uh, CDBG Social Services Committee, for which I am a member this year. We had the public hearings on Tuesday night to hear from the 13 agencies who applied for funding this year. Uh, this, of course, is HUD funding that is granted for social services. 15% uh, of all the CDB dollars are earmarked for that. And with 13 agencies applying, obviously we have a lot of uh, work to do as the members of the committee do our scoring and uh, make our recommendations for how the $130 that's estimated to be able to be allocated uh, will be allocated to the various social service organizations. Um, so with that, let us go to our first opportunity for public comment, not on this evening's agenda. And uh, we will begin by seeing if there's anybody from our Zoom community who might want to make a comment this evening before we go to the chambers. 
Yes, if there are any members of the public on Zoom that would like to speak, uh, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. And if you're not able to locate that raise hand button, please send a chat to the meeting host. All right, and here in chambers, who would like to make a comment not on our agenda this evening? I see one hand. All right, very good. Um, go ahead and take the podium and you will have five minutes. Um, hello, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, I usually st like to start the new year by asking you guys to look forward to uh, the future of funding the bare minimum, a sidewalk network. Um, this year, instead, I think I'll look back. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, so here's the report from the 2011 Bloomington Platinum Bicycle Task Force. This task force was co-chaired by Councilmember Rollo. Um, it produced a list of goals to be met by 2016 so that Bloomington would be recognized as a platinum bicycle-friendly city. At the time, I criticized it for being unambitious. Um, let's see how it held up, you know? Six years after, its, its goals were supposed to be completed. Next, please, thank you. Um, these three goals lay out uh, what became the Greenways program today. Um, these were supposed to be mostly built out by 2016, uh, but almost all the work that actually happened th by then was, was superficial, basically pennies for paint here and there. Um, only since the 2019 transportation plan has there been any serious effort at making these Greenways into a quality connected network. Um, next slide, please. Uh, by 2016, the B line was supposed to be extended on at least one end. And that still hasn't happened. Um, an extension on the north end is finally planned for this summer, tentatively. Um, the Cascades Trail is also in this report. It was included because Parks had already <sighs> secured funding for it. Um, since then, they've gone through multiple funding rounds. They've gotten about $5 million for it. Uh, that money has come and gone. It's been spent. And it still doesn't connect to even a single one of its three destinations. So from a transportation perspective, we never met that goal. Um, next slide, please. These school-related programs all require resources from MCCSC. Uh, they simply haven't happened. MCCSC has no safe routes to school program. That's uh, a pipe dream, it turns out. And we haven't passively, incidentally attained these goals. Uh, I, I do walk to school every day. Only tiny minorities walk and bike to school every day. It's mostly cars and, of course, bus. Um, 10 years later, no progress. Next slide, please. And the police department was supposed to become a positive resource. Uh, targeted enforcement around schools and high crash areas, you know, that would really help. It hasn't happened. Uh, in fact, Captain Oldham himself harassed me for walking in the street with my kids um, when the sidewalk was flooded on the way to Fairview Elementary. So, you know, in your heads, imagine a high-ranking cop trying to bully elementary kids into walking in a raging creek. And you've got about the shape of BPD's safety efforts for pedestrians. Educating officers about bike and ped safety simply never happened. Um, next slide, please. Here's where it comes all together. This is the quote, achieve zero annual bike and ped deaths. Um, we have the tools for this. This was an achievable goal six years ago. Uh, just four months ago, a scooter rider was killed riding legally in the bike lane like he was supposed to be. The work to make it a reality simply isn't happening. You know, this wouldn't seem so poignant to me, except that other cities, even in the United States, are seeing success. The roadmap is clear. Have a modest plan, complete its goals, and then keep going. Jersey City, which is about three times as big as Bloomington, three times as big as us, zero fatalities last year on their city streets. On our city streets, we've had three. We've had more if you count INDOT. Their successes make our failure stand out. After more than a decade since it was called for in the Platinum Plan, our Greenways program is finally picking up a little steam. So from my perspective, that is a pretty bu big bureaucratic failing. It took a decade to even get started on a modest plan. And you can see this inertia has a result measured in blood. We are not getting the benefits we'd be getting if we had been able to boldly implement these plans. But that's not what this body is upset about, is it? City staff made the mistake of trying to install a traffic calming in Elm Heights. Shame on them. And now you're ready to bury the whole Greenway program in an un unnecessary administrative overhead after it's already six years behind. He's smiling at me. 
We've got a serious egregious failure of city government here. Our systematic inability to follow through on bike and ped plans is leading to preventable deaths every year. Deaths. Our lives depend on, I just said the word death and he still has to wipe the smirk off his face. Our lives depend on our elected representatives taking an interest in this failure. But instead, you're wasting the people's time on placating some knee-jerk reactionaries in Elm Heights. What the hell, guys? Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there anyone from Zoom who would like to make a comment? Yes, first up on Zoom, give me just a moment. Apologies. Anyone here in chambers? I see someone has come in that would like to make a public comment not on the agenda. All right, we will go ahead with our Zoom commenter. First on Zoom is Eric. Welcome, Eric. You will have five minutes to make your comment. State your name, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Ost, and I did not come this evening prepared to make a comment, but um, I felt important to offer a comment. Um, there's a lot of passion around um, transportation and transportation infrastructure. And I think it's important to look at it with passion, but also objectivity. And I must say that the recurring pointed comments that are directed at Elm Heights are unfair and somewhat unrealistic. I, I don't know how much I want to go into this this evening, but again, I, I just think it's important to look at these things objectively and to spend our resources, our scarce resources, on areas that will make a difference, such as sidewalks, pedestrian infrastructure, I know it's not as sexy as bicycle lanes uh, and large scale projects, but I think we could invest strategically to make measurable improvements in our infrastructure. And in regards to this comment I made about objectivity, um, I think measuring the before and after are very important. Um, traffic calming is traffic control. Bicycles are vehicles. I don't think that it's a far reach to look at things in comprehensive fashion. Um, the council is one opportunity to do that. It did that before. Um, in terms of projects that have been completed, we in Elm Heights successfully moved through the process and have achieved installation of a stop sign at an intersection, which is where stop signs are supposed to be installed and do have an impact, a positive impact. So I don't know how much more I want to go into this at this point, but I, I just would say thank you. Thank you to everyone, including Mr. Alexander for being involved. And let us move forward as a community to actually objectively and measurably improve the safety on our streets and sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ost. And here in chambers, we have one more comment. Please take the podium and state your name. You will have five minutes. I'm Mark Haggerty. Um, one of the things that we, well, we can see in some ways um, how our community is failing. Uh, we have gunfire, knifings, stabbings. Uh, this area downtown has become dangerous, more and more dangerous. Um, one of the things I've talked about with basketball is how it's a de democratizing kind of activity that it brings uh, ages together, not so much sexes, but doesn't exclude women. Uh, but 
between when school gets out at night and, um, and say bedtime, a reasonable bedtime for school kids, there's no place for a poor kid to go and get a pickup game. Now, the Banneker has rented out every, most nights to people that pay money. Um, the Boys and Girls Club doesn't have such a thing. I've been trying to get lights in down at the Switchyard Park. Uh, tonight, the tennis court is blazing bright down by the Y. Every high-rise parking garage you can see from space. Um, parking lot out here. Every place but the most democratic, most classless place in Bloomington, right next to a police station, is not lit up. The, the, pi the pickleball ball courts are, the skateboard park is, the baseball diamonds are. <laughs> Uh, it's not that we don't notice those of us who play down there. So anyway, um, our problems are systemic like the rest of the country. We're not providing something for these boys to do that's aggressive and, and takes more and more skill that they get better, in at, better at and get to interact with people that are, that are older and maybe doing better and are still athletes. There's something about, and this is what Bloomington is supposed to be about, basketball culture. I have watched basketball being squeezed out of this town. I remember when the Hyper Building was free. You didn't even need an ID. At that time, it was the center for the whole state. Knights teams played on number one court at the Hyper Building. This place is being squeezed basketball free. The only place that people were playing in the cold at sunset the last several nights is the Switchyard Park. You got kids down there shooting ball until it gets after dark. So anyway, uh, we're keeping the rims up and uh, I thought you'd appreciate that. But I think of it as an overall systemic problem that if we could provide for just, especially these youth, these aggressive boys, the ones that are taken to firearms and violence, just a basketball game after school. Why not open up the schools? We're supposed to own them. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Any last comment from Zoom? All right, seeing no more public comment, we are ready to move now to our election of officers. Madam President, I nominate uh, Council Member Sue Scambaluri for Common Council President for the year 2023. Moved and seconded. And so do we um, have any other nominations or do we go ahead and with the discussion of this nomination? All right. Do you like to make a co comment? Just one, question. Mm -hmm. Was it proper one at a time or just One at a time, one office at a time, yes. Thank you. Do you care to make a comment before um, we call the vote? Thank you to my colleagues. Um, thank you for that nomination. I very much appreciate it. I am grateful every day uh, that I get to serve on this council with the talented people that I do. Um, as I look ahead to this year, as I think back on some of our very meaningful discussions at the end of last year, uh, I think there's a lot to look forward to. I think the, the Committee on Council Processes has a great deal of promise uh, and has some, some very exciting things to look forward to. I think we have opportunities uh, for some increased communication around scheduling um, that can allow us to be even more productive this year. Um, and it's I've been grateful for the opportunity to talk with almost all of you individually um, and been grateful for the ideas that I've heard. And I look forward to continuing those conversations. All right. Thank you. Very good. And if there, yes, Council Member Boland. I have a question. Um, Council Member Scambaluri, you uh, have expressed your interest in the Committee on Council Processes. Uh, you say in particular that you're interested in exploring how we can increase or enhance public engagement in local government. 
uh, but we look to the President for leadership. Are there ideas that you are hoping to advance? Uh, uh, is there any kind of uh, proposal that you uh, hope to see happen that might improve the nature of our, uh, the conduct of our meetings or the nature of our processes? Could you comment on that? Could, could you comment on that? Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. I think, I think it's an excellent one. Um, and by way of reminder for the, sorry, by way of reminder, um, one of the elements of the committee proposed and discussed um, with Council Member Flaherty's leadership last fall um, focused on increased public communica communication interaction with the public. Um, most of us hold commit constituent meetings and are in regular touch with our constituents even beyond those meetings. I think there is an opportunity to encourage council members to report back from those meetings more than they do. Um, I know that I will typically announce my, my constituent meetings, but I don't often talk about what our discuss how our discussions unfold and the kinds of ideas that come from there. So I think that's an opportunity that we have. Um, I think the same is true with additional reports from the boards and commissions um, to which we will be appointed. So I think that's an opportunity as well. Um, those are the ideas that occur to me as, as a whole, but I think, all, I think that's everyone's responsibility, and I appreciate what you've said, that the president provides leadership for that. That's something I would like to see from all of us as council members. Well, if I may follow up to that end, uh, does, do you have any interest in setting limits on uh, any given condition during a council meeting, such as the amount of time devoted to question and answer for each member, the total amount of time devoted to question and answer, the amount of time, uh, uh, the total amount of time given to public comment per item. Are these the kinds of uh, process reforms that you would at least entertain, if not be supportive of, as president? Certainly. Um, and I, again, that's one more reason I look forward to the work of the Committee Committee on Council Processes is our interim title. We, we refer to it in different ways, but that's part of the reason I'm looking forward to that committee, because I think those are going to be among the discussions. Thank you. Have. Any other questions? And if there are no further nominations, let us go ahead and uh, have the clerk call the roll on the nomination of Council Member Sue Scambalori as President of the Council. Council Member Smith? Yes. Bolin? No. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. And that passes eight to one. Congratulations to our new president. And then let us move on to the nominations for a vice president of this council. Madam President, I nominate uh, council member Isabel Piedmont Smith as vice president for, of the Common Council for the year 2023. Second. second. Moved and seconded. And Ms. Isabel Piedmont Smith, would you like to make a comment, statement? Um, I don't really have a statement prepared. I would be um, pleased to serve as your vice president, and I would be, I feel like I have a good working relationship with all of you, but uh, including Council Member Scambaluri, and so I think that we would be a good team. Thank you. All right, would there be any questions for, yes, Council Member Bolin? I'd like to direct the same set of questions to Council Member Piedmont Smith. Could she comment, please, on uh, specific ideas that she might have or endorse to the, um, let's call it the tightening of lengthy council meetings through time limits or other process improvements? Um, yes, I uh, am in favor of time limits. I think that um, this should be discussed by the processes committee or whatever name it ends up having. Um, because of course there's uh, um, a question of, of what the time limit should be, for what part of the meeting, how it gets enforced, things like that. Um, but uh, on its basis, I am, I am in favor of time limits. Thank you. Any additional questions? 
And if there is no other nomination on the floor, we will once again call on the clerk to call the roll on the vice president position for Council Member Piedmont Smith. Council Member Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Ann Smith? Yes. Thank you, and that is 9-0. Congratulations to our new Vice President. And then I would like to nominate for parliamentarian um, Council Member Rollo. Second. All right. Mr. Rollo, would you like to make a statement? Yes, I'm in favor of time limits for the public. And I would be happy to, uh, to serve as parliamentarian. Um, I will rely, of course, heavily on uh, Stephen Lucas, council attorney, for any uh, significant disputes between council. Um, so we have that objectivity. Um, and I appreciate the nomination. I look forward to working with my colleagues in a fair and impartial manner. All right, would there be any questions for the nominee for parliamentarian? I'm seeing none, and seeing no other nominations from the floor, let us call on the clerk to call the roll on our parliamentarian position for Council Member Rollo. Council Member Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Pass. Clarity? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Voling? No. All right, and that passes 7 1 1. All right, and congratulations to our new officers. We have our new slate for the coming year. Madam President? Yes. If I, uh, Madam, Madam President, President. Yes. <laughs> Emeritus. So, uh, pres <laughs> Madam President Emeritus, if you will. Um, before we recess and rearrange uh, our seating, I wanted to take w one opportunity, my last act as uh, Council Vice President, to recognize the work that you have done this past year. Uh, as I was thinking about some of the comments I might want to offer, uh, I got to thinking about what we had accomplished under your leadership this past year. And we've done a lot of fairly routine work uh, salary ordinances, stormwater rate adjustments, Title 15 changes, and right-of-way vacations, and, and uh, things that, that happen very commonly for council. We also worked on a lot of much more unique legislation, like project agreements for citywide broadband, general obligation bonds, and park district bonds. We established historic districts. We established new council districts in a pretty substantial pro process. All told, if my count is correct, we worked on five appropriation ordinances, 30 ordinances, 21 resolutions, 28 regular and in 28 regular and special sessions, over 200 roll call votes that you presided over. Uh, I didn't even count individual reports or, or individual comments from the public, um, but you pr presided over that as well. So um, for all of that hard work and for all of that leadership, uh, you not only received this gavel, which is very small, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you receive our thanks and our esteem. So please Thank join me in recognizing much. Susan Sandberg. I appreciate that very much. I have appreciated serving with you and you as well, Parliamentarian Rallo, and all of you on the council. It's been, a, it's been an interesting year, and I look forward to the year ahead and the new leadership. So with that, we'll take a brief recess, but I don't know if you, as council president, as I hand the official gavel over to you, uh, want to talk about the seating chart before we get up and move, or if we... Sure, okay. I can do that. Um, Madam Chair, before you give up the chair, yes. I think um, what Council Member Scambler just did deserves a round of applause. I yeah. totally agree with what she said. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll go into a brief recess um, shortly and give folks a chance to move around into new seating. The three center seats uh, will, going left to right from the audience point of view, will be Council Member Piedmont Smith as Vice President, myself as President, Council Member Rollo as Parliamentarian, 
And then beyond that, we're just going to work alphabetically. So from the far end, Council Member Flaherty, Rosenbarger, Sandberg, then the three, then Council Member Sims, Smith, and Volan. Thank you. Should we take our name plates? Do you, that would us. be helpful, yes. Yes. And if you would, please take your name plates. <laughs> First order of business tonight is appointment to standing committees and special committees of the council. Um, first order would be the establishment of a special committee on council processes. Um, this goes back to a proposal from council member Flaherty last November, I believe, uh, and has several elements to it. And again, uh, we've heard a little bit about that tonight, but I look forward to hearing more of that work and seeing more of that work. Uh, in the days to come. Appointed to that committee, the Special Committee on Council Processes, are Council Members Flaherty, Piedmont Smith, Rollo, and Scambaluri. And that committee will be chaired by Council Member Flaherty. Next, if I'm going too fast, just tell me. Next is Climate Action and Resilience. Appointed to that committee will be Council Members Flaherty, Piedmont Smith, Rollo, and Smith. And that committee will be chaired by Council Member Rollo. Next is the Jack Hopkins Social Service Committee. Appointed there are Council Members Sandberg, Sims, Rosenbarger, and Smith. And that committee will be chaired by Councilmember Sandberg. Next is the Sidewalk Committee. Appointed Transportation, Transportation Committee, I'm sorry, my fault. He's actually named the Sidewalk Committee as of a resolution, I believe, in 2022. Okay. Appointed there are Councilmember Sandberg, Sims, Rosenbarger, and Volan. And that committee will be chaired by Council Member Sims. That moves us into interview committees. And these will not change this year, so these, these appointments will sound familiar. Interview Committee A will be Council Members Smith, Sims, and Rosenbarger. Interview Committee B will be Council Members Flaherty, Scambaluri, and Volan. Interview Committee C will be Council Members Piedmont Smith, Rollo, and Sandberg. Okay. Any questions or do I need to go over any of that again? Okay, all right. Moving next to appointments to boards and commissions, I'd like some additional time to consult with Council Members um, before those appointments are actually made. So we will make those appointments at our next regular session on January 18th. So with that, we move into legislation for second readings and resolutions. Resolution 22.20 is next, I believe. Madam President, I move that resolution 2220 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Here we go. Resolution 2220, a resolution responding to Monroe County Board of Commissioners Ordinance 2022-46. The synopsis is as follows. Resolution 2220 expresses the Bloomington Common Council's support for the formation of a capital improvement board in furtherance of the Convention Center expansion project. Your council action um, adopted it with a vote of 810, and the mayoral veto came back on December 23rd, 2022. Madam President, I, I move that Resolution 2220 be adopted. Second. With that, uh, the sponsor of this, this resolution is Council Member Sandberg. Council Member Sandberg, did you want to say some additional comments just to reorient us to? I will defer 
this point to Council Attorney Stephen Lucas to get us started here. I can certainly add on to whatever uh, he can provide for us this evening. Yes, I'll, I'll uh, give just a brief explanation as to why this is back in front of you. As, as Clerk Bolden noted, uh, this ordinance was adopted by the Council on December 14th. Uh, it was then uh, submitted to the mayor's office for the mayor's signature and was returned without his signature and with a veto message that was included in your packet for tonight's meeting, uh, which is, is the reason why this is back in front of you for additional uh, consideration. Uh, under state and local code, uh, when an item is vetoed, the council has an opportunity to pass that item over the mayor's veto uh, with a two-thirds majority vote. And so if the council wishes this resolution to stand, it should consider uh, uh, the motion to adopt, which is in front of you now, uh, and that will require a two-thirds vote to, uh, to pass. Uh, I will note, uh, just to head off a question, um, the ordinance that the county commissioners adopted that, that prompted this action um, included uh, an expiration date, essentially, of December, uh, excuse me, January 1st of 2023. That has, has come and gone, and, and obviously the, the mayor uh, has indicated he does not support this resolution, and so uh, uh, there may be those that, that feel this, this is moot, but if the council wishes uh, its uh, explanation or its, its statement of, of the council's position to stand, uh, tonight's an opportunity to, to do that. I will say without a two-thirds vote tonight, this resolution would be defeated. So uh, that's the procedural explanation. I, I will say uh, an invitation was extended to the county commissioner's office. I, I see we have uh, one commissioner here with us in person, and I believe one on, on Zoom. Um, and so I don't know if there are any, uh, any additional comments that the chair would like to invite from, uh, uh, from any of those. Yeah. Folks, um, Councilmember Sandberg, anything to yes, add? Yes, just just with respect to the council action that was taken on 12:14, we were given a very tight deadline in order to uh, show our support of what the county was hoping was a path forward for the extension of the um, CIB as the mechanism for any expansion to the convention center, and uh, with use of the food and beverage tax dollars that, of course, are there for that purpose. And I think the vote of 8-1 certainly showed the will of the council at that time to be collaborative and cooperative with our county colleagues um, who proposed this, not giving us much time to take action. And so I feel it's important to bring this back for council consideration, even if it is moot at this point, as an integrity uh, respect for the will of the council. We, we are separate from the, the administration with our desire to move forward in certain ways with our county colleagues. And I feel it's important just, uh, if, if nothing else, to just show our support for a uh, cooperative way for this to move forward. And so I'm hoping that we can, uh, with the same uh, numbers, uh, if not unanimous approval on this. And then, of course, it will be up to the county to decide where they go from here, because things may have changed with their deadline of uh, the end of last year uh, to, to get the approval of the city council and with hopefully the approval of the mayor as well. This is a resolution, uh, but I think it's important to bring it back to the council so that our decision that was made in December will have an opportunity to stand. Thank you. And I note that we have Commissioner Thomas with us this evening. Commissioner Thomas, would you like to share any remarks right now? I caught you off guard, sorry. Good evening, uh, Julie Thomas, Monroe County Commissioner. Thank you so much for putting this on your agenda and hearing us today, and Happy New Year, by the way. And yes, I do agree that we had a very short time frame for you in December, and um, I appreciate that uh, you all were willing to hear from us and to consider it then. Um, just a comment, and, I, and my colleague may also want to comment from Zoom. Um, it's true the resolution before you tonight is not legally binding um, in the sense that our deadline came and went. The resolution we had put forward at the end of 2022 was brief and very basic because we just wanted to get the temperature of the room, as they say, uh, to see where we were before moving forward. That's why 
we moved forward when we did and asked for a, a speedy deadline. I see what you're doing today as a litmus test. And me, any amendments you choose to make and whether or not you have enough votes to override the mayor's veto is important because you are going to be sending a signal. And there will be additional subsequent measures that will have to be passed in the very near future um, if the state legislature acts. Um, and that must, those must be passed by a veto-proof majority. Do three of four, three of the four government bodies support the concept of a um, CIB or a Capital Improvement Board? That's really the question. Again, we are pro opposed to the 501c3 measure that the mayor has put forward. It removes all county input in the process. Please remember one, first, that the county council provided the food and beverage tax to fund this project based on the administration's promise of city-county cooperation. And remember, please, number two, the convention center has been managed uh, through Monroe County government for decades very successfully. I ask respectfully, please consider your vote. The message you want to send to the state legislature as they begin to debate Senate Bill 37 regarding food and beverage taxes. What do you want county government to learn about your interests? And lastly, what message do you want to send to the community? And that's, that's it in a nutshell. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And I believe we have another commissioner you mentioned on Zoom. Are there different comments to offer or? or? I believe Commissioner Jones is with us on Zoom. I'm not sure if uh, she has any comments. Commissioner Jones, did you have additional comments or shall we proceed with just Commissioner Thomas's statements? Hearing nothing? Okay. Yes, um, I'm sorry, it was rather difficult. I was not allowed to unmute for a minute. And no, actually, I just support Commissioner Thomas's statements. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'd like to, we'll come to council questions in a minute, but I wanna acknowledge too a statement received from the mayor on December 23rd, 2022, outlining his preference for 501c3. Does the mayor's office of the mayor have anything additional in addition to that letter? Uh, Mary Catherine Carmichael, office of the mayor. No, the, I think that between that statement and then uh, the mayor's veto message, um, I think we've said what we have to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's come to council for questions. Council Member Volan. I have a question for the commissioners, just one that's come up since. Um, uh, this whole discussion has been had. Um, I know the county council was the entity to approve the tax, but uh, uh, what would you say is the commissioners, and you may have stated this in, in public in the past, what would you say is the uh, commissioner's stance towards the existence of the food and beverage tax? Is it something that you support or something that you believe should be repealed? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I believe um, I can only speak for myself. Um, and I will say that if um, we are going to move forward with the CIB in cooperation with um, city government, that we need the food and beverage tax. So I would support it. And I, I'm not sure if that directly answers your question or not. That, that does on your behalf. I don't know if I could impose on Commissioner Jones to answer the same question. Yes, I agree with Commissioner Thomas. Um, if this project, if, if there is an appetite to move this project forward, we will need the food and beverage tax. Thank you both. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. This question is perhaps for uh, Commissioner uh, Thomas or, or Commissioner Jones. I attended the legislative update luncheon last week that the chamber sponsored and of course questions were asked of all of our representatives that were there and um, one of the questions was asked about the jeopardy factor of the food and beverage tax 
being um, eliminated from the General Assembly, which of course are going to be in a long session this year. And I recall um, uh, Matt Pierce's answer was quite alarming that it could very well come back to the committee. And uh, what is your take on that? Do you, do you have any assessment as to what the appetite is in the General Assembly to, if we are not going to make any progress soon, to have the food and beverage tax completely taken off the table? Well, I certainly can't speak for the General Assembly, um, but I can say that um, without the um, support of the administration and um, as we discussed today um, in, in our administrative meeting, um, even with the support of um, the city administration, we will have to do something to demonstrate to um, the General Assembly that we're serious about using the food and beverage tax. And if you think about it, one of the very first things that would have to happen is an agreement on the CIB structure. Everything we do, you will need to have a veto-proof vote at this point. And um, I'm sure you all appreciate the gravity of that. Um, so it, the CIB structure, a bond, how are we going to get a bond passed quickly? Um, that, would, that is going to fall into the city's purview. Um, and so there's a lot of work that will have to be done. Um, it would be nice to know what they intend to do and where most, most folks are um, in terms of that, but I don't know that. Sorry to say. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. May I, be allowed, may, I, may I be allowed to speak oh. to that question, please? I'm sorry, yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mary Catherine Carmichael, Office of the Mayor. So uh, I follow this, uh, you might know in my past position and in my current position, I follow the General Assembly very closely. Uh, we have a firm that works for us uh, in Indianapolis, uh, helping us keep an eye on issues, important issues uh, for the city of Bloomington. This, of course, numbers among them. Um, there are many ways to demonstrate progress. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, it's so dry in here. Um, so we are in touch with those legislators who are bringing this uh, legislation forward. Uh, you might remember that this was brought forward last year. Um, it did not go through. Um, I think that um, it's possible that the risk of this at the General Assembly, uh, the food and beverage tax being uh, done away with for communities who already have it, um, I don't necessarily agree with the level of risk that's been represented by some other folks um, based on my communications with people in Indianapolis. So, um, and again, there, there are different kinds of progress. I think the fact that we're still talking, uh, we are moving forward toward uh, some kind of resolution, and I would just remind this group that a CIB is not the only tool in our toolbox to accomplish building a convention center expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, actually, my question is for Ms. Carmichael. Um, welcome as Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, uh, my question is, um, does the mayor's administration intend to move forward with a 501c3? Yes. And is there not um, a county uh, representation that would need to sign off on that? No. Can you explain, please? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought that the um, I thought that the uh, um, the commissioners would have to sign, or perhaps it's the county council would have to sign up, sign off on expenditures from the food and beverage tax going towards uh, any kind of entity. So those are two separate issues. Okay, a 501c3 establishment um, is independent of the county. Um, but if you're talking about food and beverage uh, expenditures, yes, that does have a, a county component to it. But I was really just strictly answering the question you were asking, I think. Just the structure question. Yes, correct. That's right. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Sims. Thank you. This is for Deputy Mayor Carmichael as well. Um, Deputy Mayor. Look here, not up there. Thank you. Um, so that I'm clear on this, a 
5013 does not require or need county input. That's correct. So that would, in essence, separate city and county from the convention center. So, I, I, which, I, which I'm not, so, you can't take the county from the convention center, so what, would we do something else? I, mean, I, I just want to be clear. I mean, because we're just saying that explanation, I, I get it, but it don't make it clear to me. So okay, if, you, if you're going to do that and the county has no input, then that tells me then we'll separate from the county with regard to the current convention center. Is that, I, mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but no. I mean, what, what are we saying? Right. So a 501c3 organization, as the administration is envis envisioning it, would not just be a replacement or an for a CIB. There, there are lots of things that a, a 501c3 uh, could do that would benefit the city. We're getting ready to um, talk more about that this week, in fact. But I would say that um, a 501c3 has the ability to uh, manage uh, other city properties. Um, you know, staff spends a great deal of time right now on things, uh, Hopewell, um, taking care of, you know, interfacing with the Waldron, um, other arts uh, components, other properties that we own. So this would be uh, another um, city influenced and um, sorry, I don't have the right word here, uh, organization, um, but not uh, city run, strictly speaking. Um, so again, more information coming out about this this week. Um, but as far as separating from the county, um, you know, a 501c3 organization would be separate from the county, however, there are many, many touch points that would include the county by necessity and by choice along the route to a, a, a convention center expansion. Um, the state legislature has set things up so that the bulk of the money um, from the state flows through the county, and so uh, the, and the county makes a lot of appointments to important boards um, and commissions that influence the funding um, and has to approve funding, in fact. So there are, again, many, many opportunities and necessities for uh, cross-pollinization, if you will, on this project. So even, even, if, even if there is a separation um, in a 501c3, that doesn't mean that this is just the city going off by themselves. That's not even possible. Okay, thank you. Um, and I do have one more question. You said that having a bond or that debt for a bond is not the only way to demonstrate progress. Can you give us some examples on some other things that the, this state, discussion that the tonight state legislature is, might consider progress? Right. So we've been keeping them updated on what's going on here in Bloomington as far as our discussions with the county. And so they know that this is not a situation where we're just amassing money for the sake of amassing money, right? We're trying to figure out how to accomplish our goals. We've gotten quite far, um, you know, before the pandemic as far as talking about what it should look like, where it should be located, um, even have some preliminary design work that's already been completed. So all of that counts as progress. Okay, and um, what does our lobbyist say should a CIB not be adopted, which what I'm gathering is a deal breaker with us in the county. Mm -hmm. So if that were to happen, what does the lobbyist? Well, they don't because, really advise because us Because city in administration that way. is not going to be able to move forward in that regard because the county is not going to deal with it if, they, if we're not part of CIB, which I think we've demonstrated. But I guess I'm trying to be clear so a lobbying firm wouldn't really advise us on, on something like that. That's more of a, you know, internal administration uh, thing. They would say, okay, if you don't um, form a CIB, you know, what are you going to do to accomplish this? Because that would be a question that the legislature would have. And then we would respond and say, please tell them we're going to do X, Y, and Z to accomplish this goal. And we'll be able to do that along with the county leadership. 
have to, have to. We're, we are connected in, at many touch points along the way. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Uh, thank you for indulging. Sure. Welcome, Welcome Deputy thank Mayor you. Carmichael. I, I have a, a question for you that always is in my head whenever we talk about these, this issue. Um, um, and I think it's been explained, but beg my, you know, let me, uh, let me ask this again. Why is it so important for this, for the city to have the control of that entity? So, you whichever, know, whichever way it goes, why is that so important? Because I, I don't really understand that very well. I, I'm not sure how you define control. We don't have any interest in managing that facility. We know that we feel like the, the way it's set up now is brilliant and working very well for the community. I think our main interest is getting it built quickly, getting it built well, getting it built to a high standard, um, and taking advantage of uh, the expertise we have in big projects to get it done. So um, we, don't, we aren't trying to control the process long term. Our interest is just getting that asset established for this community in a timely fashion. Does, and does we fear that um, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and we've had some problems working together. So we feel like if we have to rely uh, on every single decision to be made jointly, that's going to slow things down and be really problematic. Um, again, we don't hope to control it long term. We're happy to say, hey, yeah, you manage it. This is this is just an asset that our community needs, and we want to see that happen. Okay, is there a sunset? a portion of the 501c3 so that after uh, uh, some benchmarks are, are achieved, such as it's built, it's ready, it's all shiny and new, we're gonna open the doors, and then the 501c3 goes away and, and the Monroe County Convention Center then is whole and that's it. Is that part of what seems to be going on or? Okay, so a 501c3 could in, encompass not just that project, but other projects. So I think the big um, umbrella 501c3 would be intended to have a longer sure. lifespan. However, the specific um, mission of creating a convention center expansion, I can see how that could be sunsetted. Okay, well thank you. It's Thanks. really goal oriented. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, additional questions from council? Okay, moving into round two. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, this is also for Ms. Carmichael. Um, so you say you have to work with the county to make progress on the convention center expansion with food, food and beverage tax money. So you know the county won't support a 501c3, they support a CIB. So how do you envision working with the county? I'm sorry, what was, what was, how, do, how do we How do you working envision with working with the county when you know their position? Yeah, well, I mean, I hope that we can figure out a way to make that happen. I mean, one of the funding uh, streams, for example, is the, and I, sorry, I haven't been thinking about this uh, t today a lot, but the. Um, innkeeper? Yes, thank you. Mm. Yes, the innkeeper's tax. And so um, they appoint the members of that, although some of them are prescribed by their position as, as an innkeeper, um, for example, the, um, um, Biddle Center at the IU Memorial Union has a, a place that, you know, that's kind of a, a mandatory appointment to that. So we hope that they would look at this and say, yeah, we want this to happen. We know they do want it to happen. They've been very supportive along the way. And it's our hope that they would say, yes, going forward, we'd like part of that money um, to go to this project. Also, as far as the food and beverage tax money goes, um, that's also uh, money that is approved by a board other than the county commissioners uh, or the county council. That's a, another group, and they say, yes, this is a, a reasonable expenditure, an appropriate expenditure for this money or not. So, but those folks are appointed by the county, so there's still a county connection. I, I just don't understand how you think you're gonna get a different answer from the county than what they've clearly stated. Well, and I'm, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that there are other entities as well involved. 
that are county influenced, certainly county appointed, but not strictly speaking, elect, well, they aren't county elected officials, although there may be county elected official representation on food and beverage. So you're t talking about the Convention and Visitors Center Board and the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, additional round two questions. Oh, sorry, Council Member Smith. That's okay, I have one more. Um, is there a possibility that the city would agree to binding arbitration on such a project? I don't know, but that's not something that uh, we've discussed, so I don't really have an answer for you. Okay, fair enough. Any additional round two questions? Okay, in that case, let's go to public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Bull. Well, I have a, a point of order. Uh, is there public comment on a veto override vote? I believe Council Member Bull considers uh, uh, legislation that's been vetoed in the normal course of business, so I would, I would say yes. Thank you. Let's go to council, let's, excuse me, let's go to public comment then. Uh, would anyone in chambers who would like to offer comment please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, could you please make the announcement on Zoom? Yes, if any members on, uh, members of the public on Zoom would like to comment on this resolution, please use the raise hand feature, which you can find in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send us a chat to let us know you'd like to speak. And I do see uh, a few hands going up okay. at the moment. How many hands do you see, Mr. Lucas? Three so far. And comments here in chambers? Okay. All right, let's limit, let's focus this on three minutes for a comment. Okay, I'm seeing a few. Let's start here in chambers, then we'll go to Zoom. So welcome, if you would state your name for the record. Good evening, council members and distinguished staff. This is Christopher M.G. from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Um, today, I come before this body to reaffirm the business community's strong commitment to the Capital Improvement Board, the CIB, as the essential governance structure for the expansion of the Monroe County Convention Center. Here is Eric Spoonmore's December 30th uh, column, and it's your business piece that was in the Herald Times. And it, if you want further information on where we stand, it reiterates many of the same points we did four weeks ago. And we saw then uh, an eight to one vote in favor of the CIB then. Even the lone dissenting vote uh, could not be interpreted as an endorsement of a 501c3 as a governance instruction for the convention center. And I want to preface that it's not the other uh, assets of the city. What I believe the supermajority saw in the CIB is a proven and effective mechanism to manage the complex public projects that is a convention center. This is a structure used by Vigo, Allen, and Marion County, to name just a few. Uh, there was never a convincing case to move away from that structure, and I don't think I've heard that today. And I think having the CIB as an equal three-member appointees, I don't see this sort of struggle when you have professionals on there. It takes away the politics of the convention center that I think is really vital right now. Um, we've mentioned Senate Bill 37. My interpretation is a little bit different. Um, it calls for what I think is need to be bonds issued by when that uh, legislation is enacted. Um, we heard, did hear from Representative Matt Pierce at our legislative preview, thank you those members who attended that. And he was pretty decisive in his statements. Um, I'm gonna quote him, if we don't have something going, I could see them just repealing it and saying, well, you didn't use it, you haven't used it. You've had it for so many years, we're done. I don't want to see that. It's, it's later than it seems, and I uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, who do we have on Zoom? First is Jeff McKim. Mr. McKim, welcome. Please confirm your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Uh, yes, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, great. Uh, Jeff McKim, Monroe County Council. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, all of you for the, the diligence with which you're treating this decision and the expansion of the convention center generally. I know that there are challenges to maintaining goals that might seem to conflict at times. So for example, keeping Bloomington a, a vibrant place for visitation and tourism while at the same time making progress on critical policy goals like climate change resilience. And I, I commend you all for doing such a careful job of reconciling those conflicts. 
Um, on tonight's topic, I will continue to urge your support on two fronts. First, that our convention center should be expanded and operated as a partnership between the county and the city. I understand that part partnering with the county isn't always easy. Partnerships can sometimes be a slog, but I think that we'll wind up with a better project in the long run. And when the county council passed the food and beverage tax, we promised our constituents that this expansion would be a partnership between the city and the county. And my support for that tax was certainly predicated on that partnership. It still is. I do not support the continued existence of the food and beverage tax in the absence of a city county partnership. I urge you to continue to work with the county to make this exciting development happen. And, and the second front is to make sure that the expansion is owned and managed by a public body. All of the bylaws in the world won't turn a private corporation into a public body. All those bylaws won't give the public any right to transparency, any standing to remedy a violation. Under the management of a public body like a CIB, every member of the public has the standing to demand compliance with the Open Door and Public Records Act. Every member of the public has access to the services of the public access counselor. I think the public has right to demand public ownership and public governance. You have already stood up for that principle once, and I hope you stand up for it again. So thank you again for your partnership on this project. I look forward to working both with you and with the city administration and the county commissioners to bring this long envisioned expansion to fruition. I'm very pleased to see both Commissioner Thomas and Jones here to continue to support the CIB. I know it isn't always going to be easy, but I think the partnership and collaboration will be worth it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Councillor McKim. Let's come here in chambers. Yes, please go ahead. Please approach the podium and share your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, Mike Campbell, president of the Convention and Visitors Commission. Uh, we do uh, the allocation for the innkeeper's tax here in Monroe County and have been the body that has uh, uh, operated the convention center since its inception. Uh, we have long been a... Um, uh, proponent of convention center expansion uh, and everything that has been said by the colleagues uh, that have spoken before I agree with fully. Uh, once you know we're ready to move forward and partner together, um, there have been some things that have been brought up with uh, 5013C which we would certainly have to work through uh, some details we had not talked about before if we went forward with that. So I would urge you to continue to to move forward with a vote on the Capital Improvement Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Lucas, who do we have on Zoom? Yes, uh, is Peter Iverson. Mr. Iverson, welcome. Please confirm your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Peter Iverson, Monroe County Council, and thank you, Madam President, for recognizing me. Tonight's council, I rise and ask you to join me and my other county colleagues in support of the CIB. It is something that I think is important for two reasons. The first reason I want to bring to your attention is that the time is now. COVID called into question large gatherings, and many of, uh, of us heard rumors that maybe conventions wouldn't come back. But the data is clear. The data from the Convention Center shows robust growth, both in new and returning groups using the Convention Center. In fact, the largest event at the Monroe County Convention Center happened just this winter for the Fiber Arts event, where I was able to see many of you there as well. Convention business is growing, and we are actually leaving business behind as the center is too small for certain categories of groups. Thirdly, the time is now because the data from our tourism industry is similar, similarly robust. Food and beverage revenue that you see is growing rapidly, as is our revenues from the innkeeper's tax. This shows, as well as data from our tourism uh, professionals, that hotels are regularly booked restaurants are being full, and there's so much business coming into our community that I think that the time is now to support the CIB. My second point is that the CIB is important to support because collaboration 
is important. During one of the last meetings of your council, we heard that we needed to have more we and less me, and I couldn't agree more. I think that this is one of the opportunities that we have to show the community that we can work together, that we will work together, and that we can do great things when we work together. I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your serious consideration of this important issue to our community. Thank you, Mr. Iverson. Let's come here in chambers. Commissioner Thomas. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanted to follow up uh, quickly, and again, thank you for your attention to a lot of the details and um, your thoughtful insight and questions. Um, I do want to note that a 501c3, by its nature, um, is not transparent. It does not have to have public meetings. It's, its accounting books are not open to the public. Yes, you can write that into the bylaws, but what happens if it, the public transparency portion ends? You would have to hire an attorney rather than go to the public access counselor, which is available to every resident of the state. That's something that a 501c3 cannot overcome, and I know Mr. McKim has pointed that out before. Uh, you can still create a 501c3 if you choose to for your other entities in uh, city government. That's fine. Um, doesn't need to include the convention center. So I think if you want to consider a 501c3, that's fine. But we can't allow this to be part of it. And I will answer a question that I was not asked, which is what would I do? Would I support the food and beverage tax if there is no CIB? And the answer is, I will be very loud and very proud in my uh, urging the county council to rescind the food and beverage tax as soon as possible if a 501c3 corporation is formed in order to build and manage a new convention center. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. So, let's go to Zoom, Mr. Lucas. Next is Tonda Radawan. I'm not sure I caught that last name correctly, but Ms. Radlin, please confirm your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Tonda Radwan, and I am a member of the public. Um, I was not, uh, do not have a prepared comment, um, but I would like to um, say that um, de uh, depending on what, um, comes out of the decision making here. I'm looking forward to seeing more partnerships between the city and county government. Um, I think that um, regarding a 501c3, um, I realized that I just spoke after Commissioner Thomas, who was uh, mentioning that. Um, based on the research that I've been doing on 501c3s and looking into that, and with also the concern and desire for public records and transparency, um, my hope is that um, if this information hasn't already been shared, would be to know um, who the officers would be of that 501c3. Um, it requires a board, who the board members would be, and also what their affiliations are um, in the community and their business relationships, um, because I do think that there has been a lot of questioning on where the, um, the relationships are, um, especially as we're looking at um, kind of the declining trust in government. I'm not just speaking, you know, here locally, but kind of nationally, the more that we can do to um, provide information and records publicly to show those relationships, I think will um, definitely mean that there'd be more um, willingness and support from the public, whatever the um, decision may be. Um, Thank you for your time and allowing me to comment. Thank you, Ms. Revlin. Let's come here in chambers. If you would, share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Good evening, council members. Dave Askins with the B-Square Bulletin. Um, I have a question about the legal process for the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission to make its uh, required approval of the expenditure of funds. My understanding is that uh, Certainly, that group has to v give a majority vote uh, for the expenditure of funds. But the, my question is, how does that 
uh, issue get put in front of the FABTAC. My understanding is that the, uh, it's the city council that has to vote to put the question in front of the FABTAC as opposed to the administration. Uh, and so that's the question that I'm hoping we can get some clarity on. Um, and just as a side note, it's 79 degrees in here tonight. It's not my fault, even though <laughs> the uh, thermostat is behind the seat where I'm sitting. I've tried to adjust it downward. Uh, it doesn't seem to have had any effect, uh, but it's really warm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Askins. Let's go to Zoom. Mr. Lucas? Yes, uh, we have a comment from Sam Dove, uh, who says, I think the council needs to pass uh, to this issue. It needs to vote again with the mayor. And I don't see any additional hands raised at the moment. Okay. Do you want to make one more announcement on Zoom? And again, if anyone in chambers has comments, please approach the podium. Yes, if there are any final uh, public comments, please let us know uh, right now by using the raise hand feature or sending us a chat. And seeing none, let's come back to council for questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I will follow up on Mr. Askin's questions and ask um, perhaps uh, attorney Lucas has the answer about whether a request um, to approve expenditure of funds directed to FABTAC has to come from the city council or whether it comes from the mayor. Yes, um, pulling up that statute now, uh, the council will recall, I believe in 2020, it passed a resolution requesting um, a recommendation from the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission on expenditures of food and beverage, food and beverage tax uh, revenues. Uh, I, th I believe that process is called for under uh, state code uh, 6-9-41-16. Uh, which says the county and city legislative bodies must request the advisory commission's recommendations concerning expenditures of any food and beverage tax funds collected under that chapter uh, and goes on to say the city or county legislative bodies may not adopt any ordinance or resolution requiring the expenditure of food and beverage taxes collected uh, without, the, without the approval and writing of a majority of the members of the advisory commission. Thank you. Yes, I do remember that process. Thank you for confirming. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay, seeing none, is there any comment? Any final comment? Councilmember Rollo. Well, this has already been said um, very well and eloquently, but uh, I'll, I'll add my two cents. I believe, as I did when we passed this resolution last late last year, that the Capital Improvement Board is the, the best means for an objective path forward. Um, it clearly is the county's preference. Uh, their insistence on a CAB seems entirely reasonable to me. Uh, it's proven to have worked in other communities, other municipalities for purposes like this and other purposes. It's the best means for, uh, to ensure transparency, uh, providing the public with legal standing and subject to state laws and and, and public meetings and records uh, request and so forth. Um, it also seems to be the, the best means, perhaps the only means for a collaborative approach with the county. Uh, that failure of a collaborative approach is jeopardizing this project, which is a tragedy. And I'll just add that I'm mystified that, although the, I understand the mayor has a different opinion, that he would veto a resolution that is the express view of this legislative body. That just seems nonsensical to me, and um, but it's, uh, I guess it's his prerogative. So I'll be supporting this again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm finally beginning to understand something that uh, hasn't been clear, and I understand why it hasn't been clear. And um, I don't know if my insight will help any, but um, it starts with the, the excellent questions that Councilman Sims just asked that seemed uh, uh, asked and answered, but I think was important to reiterate, and it, uh, it inspired me. Um, 
my brother got a phone call uh, a couple of weeks ago being invited back to Bloomington. Uh, in the Fernandez administration, he was asked to head up the first uh, board of directors of the then new BCT management organization, uh, which had just gone through, um, a, uh, it was at risk because of the first implosion of the Bloomington Area Arts Council in 2001 or so. And uh, you know, I know that, that organization has had some challenges uh, managing a, a, a building that the city administration never really knew what to do with, the Fernandez administration, the Guzan administration. Um, you know, so the, um, the existence of that, that uh, entity was important for stabilizing the operations of uh, the theater. And under the direction of Daniel McClelland, it was, it was completely stabilized and very successful, as successful as it could be. Uh, and then uh, in 2011, the BAC imploded, and we had an even bigger problem on our hands with the, the Waldron. This is the kind of thing that Councilmember Sandberg and I have talked about for years. Um, and uh, we were lucky at the time to have an entity like Ivy Tech step in to manage it. Um, but through it all, there's been no, for the past 20 years, there's been no real direction as to how to deal with these unique entities, that they aren't just arts entities. And so that's why the first thing I want to say is I actually get it and I do absolutely support the creation of a 501c3. I understand uh, that it has utility beyond the discussion of a convention center. And just for the sake of clarifying the city's ownership of these unique entities, I mean, just the discussion we've had over the historic alcohol permits in the downtown area, that's the kind of thing that a 501c3 should be helping oversee. So um, I, I uh, take the point, and I think that it's been buried in the administration's uh, sales pitch for a 501c3. Um, it is easy to confuse them that uh, if, if, the re if the reason that they brought it up was for the sake of managing a convention center, I'm agnostic about that, I don't care. It's still something whose time has come. So I agree that we should create a 501c3, and I don't think that's the question. And the question is, uh, are we playing a game of chicken? Like, at some point, if there's going to be a convention center, we have to find some way to manage it. The 501c3 could theoretically be involved in the CIB. I'm kind of agnostic at this point. All I know is that if the administration is holding out for uh, majority control over a CIB, um, I think that it's that, I mean, frankly, I think both the, the mayor and the commissioners are playing a game of chicken. And uh, I'm, uh, I hate to say that word. I, I know I have a history with it. Uh, sorry about that. But um, I, uh, this, this chicken does not appreciate that game. And I think that, I mean, I can only speak for myself. But if it comes down to we have to uh, encumber the money or we're going to lose the tax, I will vote to rescind the tax. And I am somebody who supports absolutely the expansion of the Convention Center and have been uh, a strong supporter of it for years, been advocating for it for years. But I know that my colleagues are not fond of being forced to do anything. Um, and so regardless of the animosity that's come, gone between the two different jurisdictions, and there has been plenty, and it's to no one's credit. Uh, and it, it pains me to even be saying this out loud, but I will vote to rescind the tax if we do not come up with a solution. And if my colleagues believe that, I mean, I've already voted for this resolution, which is moot. It, it is moot. It doesn't make a difference, but it expresses our will. If my colleagues believe, if the majority of them believe that a CIB is adequate, then I think the administration should find it adequate. And I think that um, if, uh, and this is a much more nebulous thing, if a 501c3 needs to be involved in the management of that CIB, I think that the commissioners should find it adequate, as long as uh, the majority of decision makers have a particular opinion, I'm going to go that way. 
Uh, but I do think the 501c3 should exist. I don't think it should make a difference in the decision of how to encumber the tax. And so by default, I have to support a CIB. So I know it's a bit nuanced and complicated. Um, I, I, again, want to enthusiastically say that the time for a 501c3 has come. It should be set up regardless of what happens with the convention center, and it should not be used to confuse the decision at hand. It's not about a 501c3. It's about who is going to be uh, primarily in charge of the convention center. I think we can, we can develop assurances that will make, I mean, no one's gonna get everything that they want. But I think we can uh, come up with a management scheme that will uh, let everyone walk away feeling at least adequate about it. Uh, but I don't want this to continue, this debate. Um, let them both exist um, and let's work it out. But uh, if I'm a deciding vote, uh, I'm not gonna be browbeaten into supporting a city only uh, managed convention center or a city uh, majority. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, first of all, the we in who rescinds the food and beverage tax is not we, the city council, it's the county council. And then beyond that, it would be the general assembly ultimately. So um, I, I once again will stand where I was on December 14th, which is my earnest hope that the city and the county can work collaboratively on this. I am growing very uncomfortable with this attitude that we are the only ones who know how to do this in the state-of-the-art correct way. That smacks of a little bit of arrogance to me. I think working together with our colleagues at the, in the county council and the county commissioners and everyone that's invested in the convention center, uh, I think we owe it to this community to work together respectfully, and so I will vote for the CIB. I'm not as fond of the 501c3 um, idea as Councilmember Bolin is for other entities, just because I'm not sure all the stakeholders involved have been adequately informed about this. And um, once again, I believe in building things from the ground up and making sure that the stakeholders that are involved in the arts community, the Buskirk Chumley, the Waldron, um, they have an adequate opportunity to weigh in on how they want to govern themselves moving forward with the structures, the buildings, the venues that currently are in the city's employ. But that's a conversation for another day. That's not what we're here to vote on today. We're here to override the mayor's veto and stand with our county colleagues in moving forward in the best way and the fastest way forward for expansion and improvements of our convention center. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, a few thoughts. First is that I didn't find the mayor's veto particularly offensive or anything like that. Um, in fact, it seemed to be his way to signal that he didn't agree uh, with forming a CIB, which was needed because the ordinance that the commissioners passed um, late last year, Ordinance 2246, said that the CIB would take effect upon um, receipt of notification from the mayor and the council that we agreed with the terms of their ordinance. So if he had signed our ordinance, that's sort of maybe signaling support for what the resolution said. Uh, so he almost needed to veto it to signal that he did not support it. So uh, I think that was a reasonable choice, I guess. <clears throat> uh, that said, I'm going to vote for this resolution tonight, uh, as I did uh, in mid-December. Uh, a reminder that um, this council passed um, an amendment to include an exhibit to that resolution. Uh, so we returned uh, feedback or support for the CIB to the county, uh, including uh, feedback on what the city would like to see, including this body, the city council would like to see, uh, to address some of the concerns that the administration had voiced in opposing a CIB. Uh, so in, in particular, seeking greater balance between city and county, uh, you know, in the spirit of collaboration, acknowledging that uh, some of the other entities involved uh, skew more heavily towards co county representation, and also acknowledging the fact that uh, the very high level of, of um, investment uh, conceived uh, is, is from city uh, portions of the food and beverage tax. So just a reminder that uh, that exhibit exists and reflects this council's view. Uh, that's still part of this resolution. Um, <clears throat> finally, I'll just uh, note that I can't help again but notice an analogy to uh, another major issue we're dealing with in the community, which is community justice reform uh, and response, and that uh, we very much need collaboration in that uh, avenue as well. 
Um, I think it's analogous in some ways because uh, it's one of these areas where uh, there's a lot of county responsibility on a particular aspect of that, the like jail. Um, but our public safety and community uh, justice system uh, very much involves uh, multiple city uh, actors, this body, the, the mayor's administration, Bloomington Fire Department, Police Department, of course, others, uh, not to mention many social services uh, entities in our community, other, other residents. So I think a more inclusive and collaborative process is needed there too. I heard a lot of talk from the commissioners and county councilors who commented tonight uh, that this is uh, one of the opportunities we have to show the community we can work together. I think um, community justice and where we go from here uh, is the other, and I look forward to that same um, uh, uh, spirits being brought to that uh, conversation. I know a few of my colleagues attended the most recent community justice uh, um, response committee meeting on Monday and voiced uh, similar views. Uh, so just another um, note that I would like to, to echo those, those views and, and support um, greater collaboration in that space. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sims. Thank you very much. Um, interesting discussion tonight. Um, first of all, I find talk of rescinding a tax ludicrous. I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> um, I understand uh, my commissioner colleague who says she would loudly and proudly vote to rescind this tax if uh, we couldn't come to like-minded in this convention center deal. Um, County Councilor Iverson said, um, that he heard at our, one of our council meetings, it must have been our last one, he says, when do we get past the, the me and, and be the we? And I'll, um, not looking for credit or anything, but I do think I was the one that said that. Um, and what I meant by that was, actually, I also said, I wish I could just put you both in a room, the commissioners and administration, and let you out when you hash this out. But it's pretty clear to me that there is no hashing. You two are so far apart and it's so grounded in what we're talking about that that's not gonna work. You know, that's okay. Um, I agree with Council Member Flaherty, the, the mayor's veto, and I didn't find it offensive or anything. It's just Monroe or Bloomington local politics. In fact, I expected it. I mean, I think many of us did. So that's just part of doing business. Um, but I've also heard about um, sending a message, um, and that may not be the exact term, um, or, or showing the will of a body. And that's what that was. That's what the, or this, this body did at the resolution the first time we voted on it. I think we made it clear um, which way to proceed. I'm not so sure that a 501c3 is not long-term a better way to manage things. I'm not sold on a CIB. Um, I'm not totally against a 501c3, but I'm not sold on a CIB. One of the solutions is the city, and we've talked about this, the city can do their 501c3 over city-owned entities. The BCT, you know, um, Waldron, you know, there's a couple other things, uh, Jukebox, uh, you know, some, some other things. So that's fine. May work just as good or better, well, just as good with the convention center. But that's the rub. So my, my goal is, after we listen to all this, how can we get this moving forward? How can we use the funds that we have been collecting since its inception? And how can we work together on this? Um, we all ask questions. Um, and, and let me know if I take too long before the committee. <laughs> um, but we've heard the discussion tonight. Um, the CIB, and I think many people know this, three mayoral or administrative appointments, three county appointments. Now, of course, there have to be some um, um, uh, based on political parties within that. But you got three appointments, three appointments. Then those six appoint a seventh. 
and that one is the president for that particular year. Okay, collaboration, 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 then we get to move on. The 501c3, five appointments, four from the mayor and one from city council. This is kind of what we're talking about to run the convention center with. What happened to the county? So to me, just because of that, the 501c3 is not viable for the convention center. It can be for everything else. I'm fine with that. Um, as Council Member Volan said, I'm fine with that. But if we can't get together, and it seems that the CIB is the best way to move forward, county council supports it, county commissioners, the business community, I think by evidence of the vote of this body, the city council does. Okay, I did ask some questions earlier and I'm not real clear that I even understand. Um, what is the long-term goal? You know, and I'm trying to uh, speak in public <laughs> and, and keep everything clear. Um, being on council as long as I have, but it's not as long as some of my colleagues, and being in a position of leadership, and I want to respect all those conversations, um, but that's kind of why I was asking. I mean, what, what, what do we see on down the line? Because we said, well, you know, I want to do A, B, and C. Well, then this makes sense. But if we won't say that, then how can this make sense? And, and that's why I wanted clarity there. I, I can't see past that. Um, and I've also not heard any real reasons, uh, legal, factual, um, otherwise, given against a CIB um, for the convention center I'm talking about. I understand the umbrella that we want to establish. I, I get that and I agree with that. But we're talking about the convention center and how do we move this forward? Um, how do we prepare ourselves if you do believe that the uh, tourism business is more robust and is making a rebound? How do we prepare ourselves for that? And I think this is the best way going forward. So um, I do support the resolution. Sorry I took so much time, but um, I think it's worth the conversation. And thank everyone else who made comments this evening. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I would rather not be talking about convention center expansion. I think in the, in the scope of what the city council can do and the city council's responsibilities to our residents, um, this is not high on my list. Uh, I was the only city council member to abstain from the vote way back in 2017 that asked the county council to approve the food and beverage tax. I um, felt it First of all, it was their business and not ours. And secondly, um, it's it's just not, as far as the use of taxpayer money, it's it's not a priority of mine. Um, especially uh, this position has been, um, I've been, uh, I've felt more strongly in this position since 2017 because of the dire nature of climate change that, I mean, today again, we, we got another report about the, the warming of the oceans. It's, you know, I would rather be focusing on other things, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and uh, rather than investing in, um, in a local economy based on people getting here by using fossil fuels and driving. Um, I think what we've learned through um, the worst of the COVID pandemic is that conventions can be held online and I think they should be. Um, so just in the, in the scope of things, this is not my priority. I don't really want to be spending all this time on it. Um, and, I, and I'm sick and tired of, of, you know, spending all this time when the um, executives of county and city can't, can't make it work, can't play together in the sandbox. It's, it's getting very frustrating. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this because I think the CIB is the best solution. But overall, I just wanted to mention that not everybody is real excited about uh, convention center expansion or feels like that's where um, we ought to spend our time and money. Thank you. Any, Council Member Rosenberg. 
Thank you, I'll piggyback on Council Member Piedmont Smith there. I share a lot of the same sentiments. Um, just some, I was the one no vote on this on December 14th and I will potentially be the one no vote on this tonight and it is, a, it's, it's not really about a 501c3 or a um, CIB for me even though I know that is the question at hand. Um, it is for me more about uh, the question of should this community be building an expanded convention center, and I think the answer to that is um, no. So uh, just a few numbers that I have read recently, there's a really wonderful book out there called Convention Center Follies, and it just talks about the data surrounding convention centers. The United States has seen a dramatic increase in convention center space in recent years, from 1989 to 2011, obviously that's a little farther away. The amount of square footage devoted to convention space increased from 36 million to 70 million square feet, an increase of 94%. The GAO calls the nation's supply of convention, convention center, center space, I'm recovering from COVID right now, not contagious, um, abundant. While other experts state flatly there are too many convention centers. Meanwhile, demand for such space is largely flat, a phenomenon that exists independent of paradigm changes such as 9-11 or COVID-19. More than half of facilities nationwide report flat or falling attendance over the past decade, while the growth of convention center revenue has fallen 79% from 2011 to 2021. I think it also, just a small note there to what Council Member Flaherty brought up on December 14th, that this is not a priority after our residents were surveyed of our community. And I think especially after the pandemic, we need to, um, I think, put this out to the public again as to what is the, the best way to, to spend this money. So I will be a no vote tonight again. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Smith. Thank you. It's clear both sides are dug in. It, it, it's, uh, if we wanna get this done, um, I'm just not, yeah, I'm not sure how this is gonna get done in the current situation. So um, I think we need professional help. Uh, maybe what about a professional mediator? Uh, maybe a social worker, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but um, to get this project done, something has to change and let's figure out how to do that so we can move forward. Otherwise, I think we're gonna be back here next year at the same time talking about the same issue. So, um, I, I mean, I just would float that idea. Professional mediator, why not? Um, binding arbitration, why not? Uh, it's done in other impasses in government. Um, I, don't, I don't see why we can't think about that at least or have some discussion about it. Um, you know, the specter of the state legislature, who knows what that means? If, if, if they stop at this all, that means we can't uh, collect it any longer or do we have to give it back? And if we do, what do we do with it? because we already collected it for this express purpose, so it gets really complicated all of a sudden. So um, I'm gonna support the resolution to overturn or you know, countermand the, the mayor's veto, but I, th I, I just think um, we're not going anywhere. Uh, it's not moving any direction. Um, and I can't be privy to each side's exact rationale, but uh, I would just force them to the table in some way with uh, finding arbitration or a professional mediator and come up with a solution and move forward and get it done. That, that'd be my thought. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Volan, one more. Has everyone spoken first round? Did you have a, mm -hmm. did you have a comment? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I wanted to uh, make another point about the 501c3 that further underscore the issue here um, besides the fact that uh, we can name specific buildings that have been sort of ambivalently managed because even though they were owned by the city uh, like the WFHB the Lotus Festival 
These are all uh, buildings in addition to the Waldron and the Buskirk Chumley, which by the way I brought up because it's gonna be celebrating its 100th anniversary this month, so everyone should uh, attend that gala. But uh, I, I, all the more reason why there should be one entity that permanently holds the city's patrimony in trust. Uh, we've tried to, um, to let entities as august as Ivy Tech manage one of our buildings, but even they were willing to give it back when they couldn't make the numbers work anymore. So if these buildings mean anything to the city, the only logical uh, step is to create a 501c3. But even there, uh, and I believe it was Councilmember Sims who brought it up, um, uh, I'm not sure who it was who said it, but they did point out something that uh, also sticks in my craw. The administration is proposing uh, a board of four appointed by the mayor and one appointed by the council. That doesn't show a lot of trust or faith in the council either. Uh, it should be at least three to two. Uh, so I think that that indicates there that the administration's goal is uh, control no matter what the cost. And uh, if they continue to pursue that, uh, first of all, any 501c3 should be three and two, not four and one. That's the only way I'd vote for it. Secondly, uh, if the administration continues to persist in this attitude, the, the, uh, uh, the, the prize will be lost. So even though I'm sympathetic to their, uh, their objective, uh, it's beyond us now. It's, we, either come up, we either do this compromise or it's going to fail. So, um, you know, that's the circumstance under which I would support uh, a 501c3. Thank you. I think that's comment from everyone. Council Member Rallo, around you. Well, just briefly in response to some of my colleagues, I'm, I'm still mystified by the veto regardless. Um, but um, maybe, maybe I, I should be more open-minded because it appears that what the mayor is essentially saying is that he'll proceed regardless with the 501c3 and this will be a likely deal breaker for the county um, since the 501c3 will largely exclude them from the process. So um, what I've heard this evening is that the, the, the tax will likely be revoked and that will be the end of this topic and that will... Um, end it. Um, but my hope for the convention center wasn't simply a convention center, it was for a civic center. That was how it was described and it was pitched and I believe that it is a good space for community programs and events and actually a, a regional meeting space as well. So um, it's not just for, I don't, I, I, I agree that uh, conventions requiring long plane travel and so forth is counter to our goals of climate change. But that doesn't mean that people don't continue to meet in spaces um, for community events and so forth. So um, this has been an enlightening discussion and uh, I will support the resolution again. Thanks. Thank you. Last call for any additional comment. Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 22-20. Yes, Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? No. Sims? Boy, I did that wrong, I'm so sorry. Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Volan? Yes. And that passes 8-1-0. Thank you, everyone. So with that, we'll move into the, our second of two periods of public comment. This is for uh, public comment on items not, on, not otherwise on the agenda. Will anyone who is in chambers please raise your hand or please approach the podium? Mr. Lucas, could you make an announcement? on Zoom, please. Yes, if any members of the public on Zoom would like to comment uh, now, please use the raise hand feature to let us know by 
clicking the uh, reactions tab or the more tab in your control bar or sending a chat to the meeting host. Thank you. Okay, and let's come here in chambers to begin. Mr. Mr. Askins. Good evening again, uh, council members. Uh, Dave Askins with the B Square Bulletin. I would just wanted to give you a temperature update. We're up to 80 degrees now. After two hours of council deliberations, feel free to make your own jokes. And anyone who didn't see that coming, raise your hand. So, uh, Mr. Lucas? We do have one uh, taker on Zoom at the moment, Dave Burnworth, who... should be able to unmute okay. if he would still like to comment. Mr. Burnworth, welcome. If you could confirm your name for the record, please, and then you'll have three minutes. Okay, Dave Burnworth, I don't think it'll take the full three minutes. Um, I was just interested in Steve Boland's uh, opposing vote to Dave Rollo as a parliamentarian. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Anything in chambers? Okay, that concludes our second period of public comment. Let's take up matters of council schedule. Mr. Lucas. Just a reminder, the council's first regular session is next Wednesday, January 18th, and uh, a brief request to stick around after tonight's meeting for a group photo. Okay. Thank you. That concludes our business for the evening. If there are no objections, we are adjourned. <laughs>